Greg Corumbus. Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is Herschel Woody Williams. He's the last surviving Medal of Honor recipient from the Battle of Iwo Jima. And sir, thank you very much for your time today. It's good to be here. It sure is. Where were you born and raised? I was born in a little town called Quiet Dell, uh, Marion County, West Virginia, near the city of Fairmont, West Virginia. So in the Marine Corps, my home of record was Fairmont, because Quietel didn't have a post office or anything else. It was a country community, and most of the people who lived there either were farm people or coal mine people. And which was your family? We were dairy farm people. Yes, we, we had a dairy farm from the time I was a little tot. When did you join the service? How old were you? I uh, tried to join when I was 17. When Pearl Harbor was hit, I was in what was known in those days as the Civilian Conservation Corps. We called it the Three Cs. I had joined it at 16. You could go in the seas at 16, and I had joined because I had a brother who had joined before me, and he was stationed in West Virginia at a CCC camp, and I thought I would go there where he was because, as far as I knew, they only had one camp in the whole state. And, but when I joined, uh, I found out I was going to Morgantown, West Virginia, another camp, there for a short time, and then everybody in that camp, there were about, I don't know, 260 of us or something like that, they loaded us on trains and took us all the way to Montana. So I was in the seas in Montana when Pearl Harbor was bombed, and the three seas were run by the Army. They had an officer who was in charge of the camp, they had a first sergeant and a mess sergeant, and, and their employees were army people, <clears throat> but all the rest of us were civilians. And we had uh, a yearly contract that you could renew every year if you wanted to renew. But the, the uh, day after Pearl Harbor was attacked, they called us all out and uh, we could get into some kind of a formation. We were not very military, but uh, they called us out and told us that America had been bombed and that uh, there's going to be a war. So they offered us an opportunity that if you wanted to go direct into the army and you were over 18 years of age, which meant you were a man, you could enlist and go straight into the army. If you were not 18, then you'd have to have parent consent. And Or if you wanted to go into some other branch of service, then you could request your release from the CCCs for that purpose. Well, I wanted to be a Marine. Uh, I've been influenced by the Marine dress blues back when I was 12, 13, 14 years old. I thought that was the most handsome uniform, and if I'm going to go in the military, I want to look like those guys. So I came home with the thought of entering the Marine Corps, 17 years old. My father had died when I was nine, so my mother was the widow, and she was running the farm. and but she wouldn't sign my paper at 17. She did not know anything about war. Uh, we had no military influence around our community at all. So uh, she needed me on the farm, and she just wouldn't sign my paper. But went to bed one night as a boy, woke up the next morning as a man. Now I'm 18, so now I don't need mom's consent. And, of course, I told her that I was going to go in the Marine Corps, and she was not, not happy with that at all. But I was 18 in October, November. I went in to enlist. I'm going to protect my country. My concept of protecting my country was that all of us going into the military would stay right here in the United States of America so that no one could come and take our country away from us and take our freedom. I had no knowledge that we had a South Pacific Ocean. I had never heard of the Japanese, certainly had never seen a Japanese person. So that's why I was going to join the Marine Corps. Not to fight a war, but to protect my country. So I went back, and I went to the Marine Corps uh, in November, 1942. 
filled out my application of enlistment, but when I got to the Marine recruiter, he didn't even look at my paper. He just looked at me and said, I can't take you. And naturally I said, why? Because at that point in time I was a pretty good specimen of an 18-year-old boy. I had muscles, you know, and I thought I was tough. I said, why? And he said, you're too short. The Marine Corps had a height requirement at that time, and it had it for a long time, five foot eight or better. You couldn't get in the Marine Corps unless you were that height. So, can't go in the Marine Corps? I'm not going to go. I wanted to be a Marine, so I went back to the farm. I would have eventually been drafted. I'd already had two brothers who had already been drafted, and they were in the Army. One of them had already been sent overseas, and the other one was getting ready to go, so uh, I would have eventually been drafted. But uh, when they took the height requirement off, that recruiter had hung on to those papers, apparently, of all of us who he had to turn down. Because in my community, we had a lot of Italian people, and Italian people basically were very short people, not very many tall people. So anyway, he came to the farm and looked me up and asked me if I still wanted to go in the Marine Corps, and I said, yeah. So off I go. Uh, end up, when I, got, when I graduated boot camp in California, I learned for the first time, you're going to the South Pacific. I had no idea <laughs> where I was going or what I was going to do when I got there. Where did you do boot camp and, and when was that? In uh, May of 1943, uh, we had 13 weeks of boot camp at that time. So we graduated actually in August of some time. And then they uh, continued to train us. Uh, they first started training us how, as a Marine grunt how, or infantry person, how do you work with tanks? They had a tank farm outside someplace in California. And they sent us to that tank farm so that we could figure out how do you work with uh, mechanized tanks. And we went through a period of that. Then they put us in a regular uh, infantry kind of a unit at Camp Pendleton. And we did additional training and hiking there, 10-mile hikes and 20-mile hikes and all that stuff for conditioning. And uh, then in uh, December, early December, they loaded us aboard ship and sent us to the South Pacific. And where exactly did they send you? I ended up, number, the first place we went was an island called New Caledonia. And it was, a, uh, they told me, owned by the French. But uh, it, was a, it was a replacement center where the Marines came in to this center and then they would send them out to the various marine divisions. At that time, we had four divisions. We had first, second, third, and fourth. And they would send them out to fill in the vacancies of people who had been wounded or killed in those divisions. And third marine division at that point was on Bougainville. And uh, they sent us, a group of us, from New Caledonia to Guadalcanal. And from Guadalcanal, we were supposed to go from there to New Caledonia, I mean to uh, Bougainville, to fill in the slots of uh, wounded and killed Marines there. But before they could get us all organized and shipped out, the Marines on Bougainville secured the island, or they declared it secured, and uh, they came to Guadalcanal. They had come from New Zealand to Bougainville. Now they come to Guadalcanal and we joined the division there. And that's where uh, I was selected, volunteered, if you will. I was told a long time before that date in the Marine Corps, don't volunteer for anything. It's a bad idea. But I was volunteered for flamethrower demolition specialist group, which was just forming because we had never seen a flamethrower before. Uh, we hadn't, hadn't had them. We had a manual with it that told us how to tear it apart and how to put it back together, but no method of, of how to use it. You know, what, what's the procedure? You know, how, how do you strap this 70-pound thing on your back and do something? <clears throat> so we had no manual that told us that. 
So we had to work that out. Uh, Describe it a little bit to how big, how long, how heavy. Okay. The, we, the unit was formed. I was a, I was a uh, Browning automatic rifle individual in a squad when I was selected to be a flamethrower operator. And they selected uh, six of us from the, from the company, from C Company and uh, assigned a uh, gunnery sergeant to be our immediate supervisor. It was his job to train us about the flamethrower. So there was a form or an information sheet with it that said we would use what we called for a phosphorus gel. It was a powder that we mixed with gasoline that turned it into a sticky gel with phosphorus in it. So that if the phosphorus hits something, burning, of course, uh, because it, when, we, when it went out the end of the gun of the flamethrower, it set it afire because we had a cylinder out there that lit, that, that lit the uh, fuel. And it would be burning, and if you tried to brush it off, you just spread it and made it worse. But whatever it hit, it stuck to and burned. And that was the first fuel that they recommended that we use. Let's pause right there, yeah. uh, Mr. Williams, and we'll be right back on Veterans Chronicles. We're back on Veterans Chronicles. Honored to be joined today by Herschel Woody Williams, Medal of Honor recipient from the Battle of Iwo Jima in World War II, of course. And, sir, you were just explaining the details of, of the flamethrower, and you were just explaining to us in, in the break how it was difficult to manipulate in many ways. Yes, that's true. Uh, the, the first fuel we were using, is a, as I said, was called a phosphorus gel that we set on fire when we expelled it from the gun, from the tanks, and it would stick to whatever it hit and burn. But it was very difficult to get on ticket, on target, because you couldn't aim the stuff. Our gunnery sergeant didn't like that stuff, so he began experimenting with other fuels. Uh, gasoline in those days was about 80 octane. So he began using, uh, we tried kerosene, we tried motor oil, we tried diesel fuel to mix, get a mix so that you could get a little distance with the flame, but it would be a ball of flame rather than one single squirt, if you will. And, uh, the, uh, with the 80 octane gasoline, apparently he didn't like that because it didn't burn hot enough. And uh, one day he came in. He, he, as a gunnery sergeant, was entitled to a jeep or access to a jeep, and he came in with a 55 gallon drum of 130 octane airplane gasoline. Uh, nobody knows where he got it or how he got it, and he wasn't about to tell anybody where he got it. But we began then using diesel fuel and that 130 octane gasoline, which burned so much hotter than the 80. And we kept mixing and getting mixtures to where we could, if we fired it from the flamethrower about 15 or 20 yards in front of us, instead of shooting it into the air, which is going to hit resistance, we shoot it on the ground and roll it into a cave or roll it into a pillbox because the ball of flame would be eight, ten feet in diameter. It's just a huge ball, orange ball of flame. And that's what we started training with and that's exactly, finally ended up, that's what we did. So we, uh, when we got ready to leave Guadalcanal and go to Guam to take the island of Guam, we mixed many 55 gallon drums of that mixture so that when we got there, we would have it available. Uh, we had 15 or 20 flamethrowers already serviced, ready to go when we got there. And uh, so that was that was the fuel that I was using on uh, February the 23rd, 1945, because we continued to use that uh, after after Guam was done. Let's briefly talk about Guam because that was the first time you got to use it, I would imagine. Uh, so what was it like to put all this training into practice? Well, actually, when we hit Guam, Guam was almost totally coral rock. Very difficult to dig caves or very difficult to build a structure on, if you will. 
because coral rock was, I think it's harder than rock, if that's possible. Although I carried a flamethrower a lot for the first four or five days of the combat in on Guam, I never had an opportunity to use it. My, uh, my assistant, you know, each guy had to have an assistant because all of the stuff that you would normally carry as a, as a rifleman, your bedroll, your pack, your extra ammunition, your grenades, <laughs> all that other stuff, you couldn't do that with a flamethrower. So my assistant would have to carry everything I couldn't carry. So you had to have an assistant to, to assist you. During the, the first five days of Guam, when we hit the beach, we had a huge hill, we called it a hill, I don't think they ever called it a mountain, but a huge hill in front of us. And the Japanese were up on the ridge. So for five days we kept trying to get up that hill to the top of the ridge, and every time we'd try, they'd, they'd beat us back. They had all the advantages, and we didn't have any. And uh, But finally, after five days with a lot of airplane bombing and strafing and that kind of stuff, we finally got to the top of the hill and and set up our own defense on top of the ridge. But I never had an opportunity to use the flamethrower because from there on, we're in jungle. I mean, real thick jungle. You, you almost Sometimes you'd have to crawl in order to get through it. So, didn't have a use for flamethrower. The Japanese couldn't dig any caves, and they couldn't dig any holes. Uh, their principal uh, defense there was to camouflage themselves, either on the ground or in trees, and you couldn't find them. You couldn't see them until it was too late. Did you wear protective gear? You mentioned all the things you couldn't carry with you if you had the flamethrower. Did you have the protective uh, coverings to make sure you didn't burn yourself? Not a bit. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't that smart. <laughs> no, when we were training, uh, we learned rather quickly, you do not fire into the wind, because you're going to get the result, not him. And <clears throat> if you fire it at body uh, shoulder level, it doesn't go anywhere simply because of wind resistance. It burns out before it can go anywhere. That's why this gunnery sergeant came up with the idea of firing it on the ground and let it roll because the wind resistance wasn't there. And I don't know whether any other outfit ever did that or not. I have no idea. I've never talked to another flamethrower operator that, uh, well, I just haven't encountered one with some, other, some of the other companies. And I'd like to. We'll come right back on Veterans Chronicles. Welcome back to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined today by Herschel Woody Williams, Medal of Honor recipient from the Battle of Iwo Jima, sir. And we're now at the stage of, of your story where we can talk about the Battle of, of Iwo Jima, February 1945. Take us ashore. Okay, when we uh, boarded the ship off Guam, that's where we had lived since we had had taken Guam in the previous July and August. <clears throat> we got aboard ship, they uh, brought out a board that had a diagram on it that uh, outlined the, the looks of Iwo Jima, and that's where we first learned where we were going and the name of it. And uh, But we were a reserve division to the 4th and 5th divisions, and each one of those divisions had 20,000 people in them. So we were uh, just a backup in case they would need us, and we were told that probably we would never get off ship. They would get us together up on the top deck. Everybody sit down, and they would brief us. And, of course, they would do that over and over because we had about 20,000 people on that ship that would probably be gone five days and then not be used, didn't think they would have to have us, because the island was only two and a half miles Long, wide and five miles long, and we'd just taken Guam that I think was 16 miles from coastline to coastline, see. So nobody could imagine that it was going to take that long to take, uh, 36 days to take that little piece of rock. And we didn't have any intelligence about the rock at all. The only thing that we apparently knew for sure is the uh, underwater demo people from the Navy uh, had gone in and cleared 
the coastline where the where the uh, Higgins boats were going to come in to make sure they weren't bombed to you know to blow the boats up. But other than that, we didn't know. Apparently, intelligence didn't know that uh, the Japanese had 23,000 soldiers on the island. That information wasn't available, apparently. And uh, we didn't know of all the miles of tunnels that they had hollowed out in that. Uh, the pillboxes were pretty well concealed because they would build the pillbox, then they would pile sand on top of it, which actually, can, if you're taking photos from the air, just looks like the rest of the ground. There were some shots, apparently, that they took coming in and showed the face of a pillbox. But we didn't know that that they had the number of pillboxes that were there. I, I have read that uh, they had 800 pillboxes on that little island. When we got there, we were uh, way out in the ocean. We could hear the explosions, but we couldn't see anything. And just sitting there waiting as to whether they would ever need us or not. Well, you've had 40,000 Marines hit that island the first day. You know, two divisions went in there. And the commanding general of uh, Iwo worked the uh, defense of the island different than what the others had on the other islands that we had taken. The defense primarily was keep them from being able to come ashore, keep them off the island, because if they can't get on, they can't capture and, you know, can't claim us. So uh, their defense was eliminate them before they get there. This guy said, no, let them come, because once we get them ashore, then they can't get off. There's nowhere to go. And uh, he had his weapons set up so that they were all centered in on this beach area, and the beach was only about a mile and a half long. That was usable so we could land on it. And so he had Marines just one on top of the other, just bunched up, of course. And as soon as that happened, why, he opened up, and that's why we lost so many the first day. That night, day that night of the first day, we over the loudspeaker were told that uh, we would be going in the next day. Have breakfast at 3 o'clock in the morning and get aboard Higgins boats and head out to the rendezvous area. So we did that and uh, the waves that day, the water was terribly rough, running 10, 12 feet waves. And uh, so we went out and there would be a group of uh, Higgins boats just running in a circle. I don't know how many were in there, 10, 12, or 15, and just go around and around and around and around because they couldn't go into the beach line until the beach master on shore gave the word to come on in. Otherwise, you wouldn't know when to go. So we never got that signal, and we rode those things all day long. Everybody got seasick. It was, it was a terrible day. They took us back that night and put us back aboard ship because we couldn't get on the island. And then the next morning we went through the same procedure and back to the rendezvous area. And just before noon that day, the 4th Division uh, had uh, been able to start moving around Mount Surabachi to the other shore. And that gave us enough ground that we could come in. And so we landed that day on the 21st of February. And we became the point, we became the spearhead of the group, and it was our job to spearhead straight forward, and the fifth and fourth on our left and right, they were to go up the coastlines on each side, and uh, which meant we had to go across the airfield. They, they had a usable airfield there, they were actually building three. The uh, first one was, was usable before we got there. The second one was almost complete, and the third one was just getting started before we got there. I've been asked, why did we take Iwo Jima? Why did we need that little island of two and a half miles by five miles long? And uh, according to what I've read and what I've been told, 
the reason we had to have it was B-29s were flying from Tinian and Guam and Saipan bombing Japan. If they were injured or got low on fuel or for whatever reason had to ditch, uh, there was no way we could rescue them. So we were losing B-29s and 11 highly skilled Americans. And the, air, the Iwo Jima airfield was permitting their fighter planes to fly off from there and shoot down our B-29s. And we had no way of counteracting that. We, our fighters from Tinian, Guam, and Saipan couldn't fly that far as escorts and get back home. So we couldn't protect them. And we had no way of rescuing them. So they told me that's why we had to, had to take Iwo Jima. So, so there would be 600 miles from there to, to Japan, and our B-29s wouldn't have to make that long trip. So uh, the first, uh, actually the first day I was there, which would have been the 21st, the first B-29 landed. It had, it had been shot up, and uh, he needed a ditch. So. Airfield wasn't quite done. Seabees didn't <laughs> didn't have it all finished yet, but uh, he came in anyway. He had to find some place to sit down, and he did. Uh, after that, uh, I, I don't know. I've been told, and I have no proof of this at all, that something uh, like 800 flights went off of there to to Japan, uh, B-29s. And, of course, we had a lot of fighter planes that could, uh, from there, they could accompany our B-29s all the way to Japan and back to Iwo Jima. Um, so they had that protection. So you're the tip of the spear, your yeah. unit. Uh, going across the airfield, we lost a tremendous number of, of Marines because there's no protection. The only protection we had was a shell crater where they dropped the bomb or a piece of artillery had hit. And you could get your body into some kind of a hole, and uh, you'd get the hole would fill up with Marines, which we'd been told don't do that, <laughs> you know. But survival is more important than somebody's order, I guess. But we lost a lot of Marines getting across the airfield. Then we hit the stream and or line of pillboxes, and they were reinforced concrete pillboxes. They had uh, what we call today rebar, but they were just metal in the concrete so that a bomb hitting it wouldn't destroy it. Uh, artillery hitting the front of it wouldn't do it. Bazookas wouldn't do it because it was so thick and so well supported by, by the iron rods. So uh, in trying to take those pillboxes uh, on the uh, 22nd, of uh, February, why well, we too were losing a lot of Marines because they had all the advantage of field of fire, and we didn't have any except that little aperture in the front of a pillbox. And and uh, my commanding officer, uh, his name was Donald Beck, and he had lost most of his officers. Most of the squad leaders were already gone. Uh, the six guys that I had in my unit, uh, they were either wounded or killed, and I don't know which, and I don't know when, or I had no word of where they were. I just didn't have them. So he called a meeting for uh, NCOs. I'm a corporal, so I'm not an NCO. you got to be sergeant or better to be an NCO, and I wasn't. But our first sergeant was still around, and uh, he told me I needed to go to that meeting. So I did. And when we gathered in a huge shell crater, probably a bomb uh, had been dropped, and it was deep enough that we could get below ground level so we wouldn't get hit with grazing fire. And during that meeting, the CO asked me if I thought I could do something with a flamethrower about some of those pillboxes. Because we had tried and tried to break through, but we just couldn't do it. And I don't know what I said. Uh, others said later I, my response was, I'll try. And, uh, but he gave me four Marines, uh, two riflemen and two automatic riflemen. 
Their job was to whatever pillbox I selected that I was going to try to burn out, they were to fire at that pillbox to keep them from being able to fire at me. So I strapped on a flamethrower and went to work. During the course of uh, four hours, most of it is absolute no memory. I don't know why. I eliminated or burned out seven of those. One of the things that has bothered me all my life, for which apparently there is no answer, is I had a flamethrower when I first started, and I can remember that very vividly. I can remember going into a shell crater with another Marine, and he was what we called a pole charge man. We'd make pole charges before we ever got to combat a 10-foot pole, 10-foot, usually a tube of two, with a 12-inch piece of wood fastened to it, and then we would put uh, composition C2 satchel charges on that, fasten it on there. So that the pole charge man, once you burned out a cave or a pillbox, his job was to run in, stick the thing in the pillbox or the hole in the ground, pull the fuse, and close the thing or blow it up so that nobody could use it again. That was his job. So a uh, guy by the name of Slagger was my first pole charge man, and uh, he and I ran out to where we found a shell crater, and we got down in the shell crater so that we could, I could decide which one of these pillboxes I'm going to take on first. You know. So uh, I did, and I told him, we're going to crawl. We'll come up out of the shell crater. We're going to crawl to the first pillbox. And for whatever reason, uh, I, I followed my own orders. I came crawling out of the hole and crawling up the, toward the pillbox. But for whatever reason, when he came out, he kind of stood up, not straight, but hunched over or bent over. And and uh, I look back, I, I can remember seeing him like that. Then all of a sudden, bullet came square in the center of the head, penetrated the helmet, hit the liner inside, then went around the liner between the helmet and the liner to the back of his head. And when that happened, the bullet was coming in at an angle, I guess, because it threw him back in that hole. Just <laughs> off he went. And I can remember seeing him flying back in that hole. And so I crawled back in the hole. I thought he's dead. And, uh, but when I got down there, he was, his eyes were still open. He was still breathing and all of that. And, I haven't got time to fool with him. I got, you know, I got to keep on going. So I left him and never did have a pole charge man after that. <laughs> Nobody ever volunteered to say, "Hey, I'll be your pole charge man." Yeah, no, I didn't have any. But uh, one of the bugaboos is I don't remember how I got the other five flamethrowers because once, once a flame, once you use up either the the five matches in the front of it that sets it afire, or all the air out of the air tank, or all the fuel out of the fuel tanks, it's a useless piece of iron. So we were taught and trained, just roll out of it. It had quick snaps on it, just unsnap, let it go. And that's what I did. I can remember doing some of those. I can remember unsnapping and getting out of my flamethrower, but saved my life. I don't know how I got the flamethrowers. Uh, I have said many times, I'm reasonably certain that no Marine back there in headquarters company said, just wait out there, I'll bring you one. I don't think that happened. But still, I don't know how I got them. But I used six, so I must have had some way of going back, and we had them stored in headquarters company. They weren't out there where I was. Strange, but I don't know. But anyway, by getting rid of seven of those pillboxes, that gave us an opening so that we could get through, break through their line. And once we got behind the pillboxes, then we had the advantage instead of them. Was they, they had no place to shoot back behind. They could come out of the pillboxes and, you know, try to shoot us, but they, they didn't have any holes back there to fire through or anything like that. So. After that, 
uh, because of the contour of the land and the rocky terrain from there north, I never used a flamethrower again. I blew up a lot of caves. I sealed a lot of caves. And I blew up a few pillboxes. But I never used a flamethrower again. They, they couldn't dig caves up there, and apparently the pillboxes, uh, I don't know, they didn't, maybe it was just so rocky they couldn't do it. I don't know. There was none up there. Uh, we were the first group to reach the northern shore of the island. That, uh, that was five miles from where we started. <clears throat> we hit the beach. We had uh, about 278 people in C Company. That was the company I was in. And on March the uh, 5th, we were down to, six, down to 17. On March the 6th, we were we got new Marines that night shipped in. Many of them didn't know anything. They'd never had combat experience at all. But we got some replacements, and the next morning we were ordered into to the attacks. We became the first first people to push forward, and uh, C Company was, and uh, we uh, hadn't been there hadn't been in in the movement very long until I got wounded. Peace shrapnel caught up with me. And uh, the corpsman came, and he didn't come. I yelled for him, and he came, practically cut my dungarees off and uh, took the shrapnel out of me, put some sulfur dr drugs on me, put a pressure bandage around my leg, and then put a tag on me. And we had been told over and over, if, if a corpsman tags you, he is the final authority. You don't question what he says. I mean, they're to save your life, so don't question him. And we've been told that when he tags you and tells you that you must go back, you got to go back. But, but those were the instructions. So he did that. He tagged me and uh, told me, now you got to go back. And because of the new Marines and so few of us still left that knew what the heck we were doing, I said, I'm not going to go. And he called me a few choice names and said, you got to go. Those are the rules, you know, that's what you got to do. So I reached up and pulled the tag off, and I said, I'm not going to go. I don't have a tag on me. And he called me a few more very choice words. And, but I didn't leave. I could walk. I thought I could make it. And uh, just a few minutes, time frame, you can't measure it. At least I, just, I couldn't. But in just a short time after that, uh, my assistant, who uh, we didn't have flamethrowers at that time, we were just rifle people. My flamethrower uh, assistant, flamethrower assistant, came running by me and uh, mortar caught him, smack dab in the center of the head, and killed him instantly. Uh, that's where I lost the best friend I've ever had in my life. We were much closer than I was to any of my brothers because our lives dependent on each other, and we knew that. He and I had made a pact several months before. I had a ring that my wife-to-be, the lady I was engaged to, uh, had given me before I left the service. Her name was Ruby, and she gave me a ruby ring. Psychologically, it worked. His daddy had given him a ring, was about, oh, I don't know, quarter inch in diameter, and he, his two fingers were grown together on both hands like that, so he wore it on this ring, on this finger. Took a lot of kidding because Marines didn't wear rings on this finger, you know, <laughs> sissified and all that stuff. You know. <laughs> so, uh, but he and I were sitting around talking, and. Uh, talking about home, no doubt, and we made a pact, shook hands, that if anything happens to me, you're to get this ring back to Dad, and he's to get my ring back to Ruby. We shook hands. And when I got to him that day, uh, he was stretched out on the ground, and there was that ring. And it's a court-martial offense to take anything off of a dead Marine. They tell you that very stringently, very forcefully. But 
I had made that com I had made that pact with him and if it court martialed me, it court martialed me, so I finally got the ring off. I had to spit on it in order to get it off. We hadn't bathed for days. <laughs> Dirty, filthy, terrible. But I got it off and put it in my pocket, kept it with me. And uh, after the combat, I wrote to the folks and told them that I had the ring, and I would get it back to them. But I was not going to mail it for fear somebody would find it and take it. I'll bring it. So after I got home in November 45, uh, my wife and I drove all the way to Freud, Montana, right up next to the Canadian border. And I delivered that ring. One of the most emotional periods, I guess, I've ever had in my life. But the ring got back where it belonged. Promise kept. But my life completely changed the day that uh, I received the Medal of Honor. It, I'd never heard of it, didn't know what it was, and I certainly had no idea how it was going to change my life. But I became a public figure that day. I didn't want to be, had no desire to appear before people. Uh, I was a very shy, bashful, really timid individual. And yet it probably was the best thing that happened to me because being the recipient involved for the first several months almost every night someplace. Just absolute. Time, time was not my own, and uh, I was forced to talk about, just as I am now, I was forced to talk about what happened and those moments of, of emotion and those moments of uh, memories that you can't forget. And I think it was a therapy for me because so, so many guys that I associated with in my 33 years of working for the VA they wouldn't share anything. They wouldn't tell anybody anything. It just ate on them. They never got rid of it. And I had a brother like that that was beat up very badly in the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, when he got home, couldn't get a thing out of him. He just wouldn't talk about it, you know. And it would have been better for him had he shared those things, but he wouldn't do it. And my... Uh, work experience, I, I encountered that a lot. So probably being forced to talk about it, maybe even relive some of those situations, I think was a good therapy. I didn't suffer as much as many of the other guys did. Sir, unfortunately, our time has come to a close. Thank you so much for your time with us today, and thank you very much for your service. Thank you. We've been speaking with Medal of Honor recipient Herschel Woody Williams, a World War II U.S. Marine Corps veteran of the Battle of Iwo Jima. I'm Greg Corumbus. This is Veterans Chronicles. Veterans Chronicles.